Good news, we are now to the final reading in the equity material here, and this is the one where we're actually going to start looking at the basic tools, that is the models that we use to come up with the value for a share of common stock. So there's, uh, if you've been wondering when you're going to have something you can hang your hat on, or you know, when is this guy going to give me some formulas that I can memorize, well, we're going to take care of that in this reading. So uh, it is an introduction to the, uh, I guess, the quantitative aspect of equity valuation. Of course, the models are relatively simple. Anytime you have a security as complex as an equity security, you have to have simple models. It's one of the sort of uh, weird things about finance. You have a simple asset. You have a really complex model. You have a really complex asset. You have to start with a simple model. It's being able to think through the inputs that make for or distinguish good analysts from average analysts. So in security valuation, what we're going to do is we are going to uh, estimate or try to identify the intrinsic value of an equity security. So if the market price is less than the estimated value, so the market price is 10, we think it's worth 12, then according to our analysis, that asset is undervalued. You want to buy undervalued assets. On the other hand, if the market price was greater than the estimated value, which is our estimate of intrinsic value, then the asset is overvalued and we'd want to sell it. Okay, but you have to remember that even if you're right, the market price is 10 and it's really worth 15, well, for security valuation to be profitable, Okay. then the security ha that is misvalued has to converge to its uh, intrinsic value that uh, only you've been smart enough to identify so far. So this is kind of a gutsy proposition to say, well, everybody else is wrong, I'm right, but pretty soon they're going to catch up to me, right? So we have to have this convergence. Uh, and uh, of course, the market price is more likely to be close to the intrinsic value if you have lots of analysts following, right? So uh, lots of analysts looking at it, that means uh, there's a... Uh, we are forcing the information into that price at a, at a rapid rate, and uh, that generally, generally makes for uh, uh, better or more accurate pricing in the market. Okay, so the types of equity valuation models. So uh, I would describe the CFA curriculum as a discounted cash flow curriculum. So we're going to start with some discounted cash flow models. These come in a couple of flavors. One of those would be dividend discount. The other would be some sort of free cash flow. Uh, you can have either free cash flow to the firm or free cash flow to equity. We're going to be looking at equity here. Um, so, uh, and uh, these are, uh, are going to be applied similarly. We're not going to do much with, uh, f with free cash flow to equity at level one. That's going to be a big iteration from level one to level two is Im embedding the free cash flow to the free cash flow aspect into these models. What we're really doing is developing the models and using the simplest Uh, valuation uh, metric, and that's going to be dividends. Uh, there's lots of firms for which that is not appropriate, right? Uh, so we, they have to have a valuation metric where our metric is indicative of the earnings power of the firm. And uh, if dividends don't reflect the earnings power of the firm, then a dividend discount model is not going to give you a very accurate answer. But that's not the
point. The point is to investigate the models and to keep things simple, for the most part, we're going to worry about dividend discount models uh, here at level one. The second type of model is going to be a multiplier model, also sometimes called a relative valuation model. And that's where we're going to take the price and we're going to relate it to something we think is reflective of price. So uh, if you buy a house, you might think the price per square foot, right? So that would be a relative valuation model. With equities, we're typically going to relate price to something we think is de directly related to the value of equity. So that might be something like a price to earnings ratio, right, is the most common of the uh, relative valuation metrics. But we could also do price to sales, price to book, price to cash flow. All those things would have the same, uh, the same, I guess, origin, right, relative valuation. And if we didn't want to look just at the price, that is the price of a share of equity, we could look at the enterprise value, the EV, but we probably wouldn't want to do enterprise, enterprise value to earnings because earnings is an equity number. We would need to say, what is the ability of the firm to generate cash flows that are distributed to all the providers of capital? So what we're actually going to look at here is what's called an EV, enterprise value to EBITDA ratio. So earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation. and, and uh, amortization. Uh, so uh, we'll say, well, this is uh, the value of both the debt and the equity, and this is a crude measure of free cash flow to the firm. That is uh, how much, uh, what are the earnings that uh, before we start dividing up into debt and equity. So this would give us a firm value if we wanted to approach it that way. And then asset-based stuff, this is going to be, let's look at the assets, uh, subtract off the value of the liabilities and preferred stock, and that would give us a value of the equity position as well. Uh, this one, uh, Uh, when we're talking about valuation of a share of equity, uh, this is typically uh, something that's reserved for some uh, particular situations, in particular bad situations, firm liquidation, that type of thing. All right? So let's think about uh, dividend discount. We'll start talking about multi-year multi holding periods. Well, remember that what we're doing is we want that the value of any asset okay, is equal to the discounted value of its future cash flows. So, um, the, and the the most general model that we can state is that you know, the value of an asset today is equal to you know, its dividends, uh, discounted uh, as its required return, uh, and to do that over all time. Right? And the difficulty here, of course, is that little sideways 8 infinity sign. So uh, the infinity sign is saying that we're going to, if we just take all the dividends forever and discount them back to today, well, the value of any asset is the discounted value of its future cash flows. Dividends are future cash flows from equity securities, so chart the dividends forever and discount them back to today. Well, that's a great place to start. Okay? But uh, before we jump to that, let's think about what would happen if we had dividends for a while and then we knew what the price was going to be. be in the future. So that's what a multi-year holding period model is going to be. So we're going to have dividends that we're going to estimate for some number of periods, in this case n periods, and then we're going to know the value of the stock at that point in time. So at, uh, five, this is going to be maybe three years of dividends, and at time three we know the value is going to be something. Well, all we have to do is discount that back to today. So it's easy to do as a quick example. Uh, stock paid a $1.50 dividend last year, uh, and that's going to grow at 8% every year. We have a 12% required return, and we think the stock price is going to be $51 uh, at the end of year three. What's the value today? All right. Well, if, uh, if you haven't looked at this before, there's a couple of pitfalls here. First of all, you've got to make sure that you get your timeline right. Okay? So uh, looking at this, we're going to say, well, time zero, that's today. And uh, one year from now, two years from now, and three years from now. Right? What's going to happen? Well, what is the dividend that goes at time one? Well, it's not $1.50. Okay? Why? Because the dividend paid last year, that's the dividend that's already been paid. Right? So that was you know, the dividend at time zero or something. When we say the dividend last year, the dividend just paid, yesterday's dividend, all that means the same. 
Okay, that's code for something that just happened in the past. So what we need is to be 8% greater than that here at time one. So we need to estimate uh, the dividend at time one as being equal to $1.50 times 1.08, right, point. Uh, and then with dividend at time two will be times 1.08 squared and three times 1.08 cubed. And this $51 also, it comes at the end of year three. Remember that this three is the end of year three, right? So if we start here today at time zero, the end of year one is at time one, the end of year two is at time two, and the end of year three is at time three. So, uh, so you got to make sure that you get your timeline right. Uh, and so let's see what the answer is. Well, the dividend at time one, so this is going to be D1. It's going to be the dividend just paid. We're going to grow, out that, grow that out for one year. That's uh, going to be, uh, I guess, what, $1.62. Then the dividend two years out. So now we're going to square it to move that uh, out by 8% each year for two years. The dividend at time three. And then the $51 also at time three, right? So these two things come at the same time. This is just the discounting function in the denominator, and it tells us the value of the asset was $40.50. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, that's great if you happen to have a crystal ball so that you know what the price of the stock is going to be uh, in three years. Well, that's right, but we don't have to know the price of the stock here. We could go out and we could estimate D4, right, and then get a price at time four. And if you don't like that, we can estimate the dividend at time five and get a price at time five, or we can keep putting that off. And the point is, we can put off the estimation of this terminal value forever uh, if we want to, and we get back to this idea that the value of any asset is sim simply the discounted value of its future cash flows. So uh, in this case, uh, it is a peculiar thing that we have to be given this terminal value. What we're really looking at here is what would be a two-stage valuation. We're going to review in depth in a little while, but where we're going to have an estimation period, and then we're going to have to calculate a terminal value. And there's just lots and lots of assets that are uh, analyzed that way. So we analyze real estate, you estimate cash flows for a few years, and then you pretend like you sell it. Uh, same with uh, common stocks when we do two stages or multiple stages. So this is uh, actually something very reflective of what we're going to see going forward. All right. So here is the model that I drew uh, on the whiteboard just a moment ago. So the value today is equal to the, the present value of uh, the cash flows through time. So here's my dividends, uh, uh, dividend time one. I'm going to discount it back one year, two, discount it two years. But it goes on forever. It's that sideways eight that is the problem. Most of what we're going to be doing over the next uh, number of slides is coming up with simplifying assumptions for this in infinite stream of cash flows. That is this in estimating the dividends one at a time forever. Uh, always going to be difficult. Uh, so uh, we discount estimating them forever and didn't discounting them back. Well, that's going to be a lot to do in a 90 second question on the exam. So we need some simplifying assumptions and uh, that's what uh, that's what a big portion of this reading is going to be about. All right. So uh, we could also do this with free cash flow. So notice that this model looks exactly the same as the sli previous slide. Only now we have free cash flow to equity in the numerator instead of dividends. So there's two possibilities for a uh, valuation metric. One would be to use dividends. That's the cash actually distributed. Okay? Uh, and then we could also use the free cash flow to equity. That is the cash that is distributable to equity holders. And uh, we're going to do a lot of comparison and contrast with that. Just most of it's going to be at level two. Uh, the free cash flow to equity is, uh, I think, a more robust metric. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, here we're just trying to learn what the models are. So let's uh, talk a little bit about it just so we have, a, a, have a, under our belt the differences between the two. So uh, free cash flow reflects the firm's capacity to pay dividends. Okay? That is, how much cash could you take out of the firm without impairing its long-term growth prospects? Uh, and it's useful for firms that aren't currently paying a dividend. So if you wanted to value Facebook, right? Uh, well, Facebook doesn't pay a dividend, and it may be a long time before they pay dividends. So if you want to use a dividend discount model, you've got to estimate how long it's going to be till they start paying, how much they're going to start paying, and how that's going to change through time. And that just adds a lot of complication to the valuation model. So if they, if they don't currently pay a dividend, then uh, you can use a dividend discount model. It's just going to be hard. There's also firms like Microsoft that pay a dividend, but that dividend doesn't seem to have much relationship to the firm's earnings power, right? So we need to be able to have a metric that has related to earnings power. If you don't pay dividends, dividends aren't useful as an earnings metric, then you have the free cash flows that you can use as well. Uh, let's see, because uh, uh, that saves us projecting the timing and uh, amount of dividends going forward.
Okay, what about preferred stock? Well, if you think way back to uh, the second study session on, uh, I think it's the second study session, on uh, time value of money, we said, look, there's these things called perpetuities. So if we have a cash flow, comes, uh, the first one comes at time one, but they're going to be the same forever, so we really don't need this uh, one, subscript one here. It's cash flow is going to be cash flow. And we take that and we divide it by the required return. Then we're going to get the value of that at time zero. So we get a cash flow at time one, and we get a value at time zero simply by dividing by the, disc, the uh, appropriate discount rate. Here we go. So what is preferred stock? Well, it's this uh, level series of dividends that go on forever. Here's the required return for preferred stock. It's abbreviated K instead of R, but it's the same thing. So K, R, the cost of capital, the opportunity cost of capital, the required return, all those things mean the same in finance. Uh, and that's going to give us the value today. All right. So uh, again, this is going to be a dividend uh, that starts one year from now. So if it paid a dividend tomorrow, we wouldn't count that one, that, or this formula wouldn't count that. It assumes there's a one period delay. We'll talk more about that in a moment. This is the Gordon Growth Model, and you've seen it elsewhere uh, previously, but uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the two most used formulas across the uh, three levels of the curriculum, at least in my opinion. So it's either this or the capital asset pricing model. So uh, this is, shows up just everywhere. So this is something you've definitely got to know. And what this is, and we talked, when we talked about um, you know, the value of a perpetuity, we said the value today. Well, if we assume the price and value are the same, so this is a, you know, the market is in equilibrium, then we're going to get this cash flow that comes a year from today, and we're going to divide it by K, and then we can subtract off R, too, we are, subtract off G, okay, where G is going to be zero, so that just falls away, right? So the cash flow divided by the cost of capital. Well, if you, this is, uh, the beauty of this thing is that it's an infinite geometric series, which is just fancy math talk for the fact that it collapses on itself. Uh, so what we end up with, if we have a growing perpetuity, so we start out, uh, the dividend last, uh, the dividend at time one is estimated to be a dollar, it's going to be a dollar and five cents at time two, it's going to be a dollar and 10 cents at time three, it's going to be a dollar and 16 cents or whatever it is at time four. Uh, it's going to be growing at a constant rate forever. Well, this is the formula that will tell us the value. And it's an exact formula. It's not an approximation. So it's uh, the present value of dividends that grow at a constant rate forever. Okay, be really careful with the subscripts here because a lot of people miss the problems on the exam because they lose track of this. If we have a dividend at time one, we're going to get a value at time zero. What's the big economic intuition behind that? There is no economic intuition behind that. It's just arithmetic. All right? So we've got to remember that if we put in a dividend at time one, we're going to get a value at time zero. And that sounds pretty easy. And in fact, it is easy when you're looking at time one and time zero. But what happens when we use this later? This is going to be a primary tool either to find the value today or to find a terminal value in a more complex model. So if I plug in a dividend at time five and I divide it by you know, k minus g, then what am I going to get? I'm going to get a value, but I'm not going to get a value at time zero. I'm going to get a value one period before. So it's not going to be time zero. I just said it's not, and then I wrote it down. It's going to be a value at time four, right? Uh, the point is there's always going to be this one period delay from the time we identify value to the um, uh, observation of the, uh, of the valuation metric. And again, there is no economic intuition. So don't be looking for any great reason. It's just arithmetic. So you've got to remember, if I put in a dividend at time one, I'm going to get a value at time zero. If I put in a dividend at time five, I'm going to get a value at time four. If I put in a dividend at time 37, I'm going to get a value at time 36. All right? So, uh, so make sure that you are, you are okay with the subscripts. And again, there's nothing there to know. It's just to memorize. All right? Okay, so a quick example here. So uh, we have a stock that paid a dividend of $1.50 per share last year. What is that telling me? That's D0. Last year, yesterday, previous dividend, all that means the same thing. If they told us next year's dividend or time one dividend, that would be D1. So it's fine. We, we can find what D1 is knowing what D0 is. And they're never going to give us D at minus one, by the way. It's always going to be D0 or D1. So uh, if we know that D0 is $1.50, we know it's growing at 8%. Well, then we know that this first dividend, dividend time one, is going to have to be, uh, what is that, $1.62. So we just got to make sure and embed that into our formula. So the price today is equal to the dividend time one divided by K minus G. D0 moved forward for one year of growth, okay, at 8%. That's going to give us $1.62 divided by 0.04. That tells us that the present value of the cash flows that started at $1.62 at time one and then grow at 8% forever, 
discounted back at 12% is equal to $40.50 today. All right? So that is, and it's an exact answer. No approximations here. So uh, this is an exact answer. And um, it, uh, it's, like I say, it's the most, one of the most used formulas in the, in the curriculum. Okay, what about the G here? Okay, so we see a lot, we're going to see a lot of formulas with this lowercase g, just like we did with the Gordon Growth Model. Well, there's maybe two and a half ways you can get uh, G on the exam, uh, and we're not going to worry about the half method yet, but uh, the two common ways are, one, they tell you that G is 8% like they did in the last one, or they give you what you need to use this sustain sustainable growth rate model. Now, I think this is a terrible model personally, uh, but nonetheless, it's the play we have on the exam. And all it says is that growth is going to be equal to the retention ratio. So remember, there's only two things you can do with net income. You can either pay it out or you can retain it within the firm. So if the payout ratio is 70%, then the retention ratio has to be the complement of that. It has to be 30%, right? So they're going to, what they likely do is give you a way to calculate the dividend payout ratio, and then you have to know the complement of that's the retention ratio times the ROE, right? So uh, they're, and that's just the return on equity, net income over equity. So, um, so this is our, uh, this is a very common formula. This is one of the most used formulas on the exam as well. If you need, it's not going to be the answer to a question. It's going to be the way to derive one of the inputs that you need to answer the question. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking for a lowercase g, they are going to tell you g is 3% or they're going to give you a way to find the ROE and the retention ratio. All right? So sustainable growth, certainly something you want to be on top of. Okay, what about multi-stage dividend discount? This is for companies that are in temporarily in rapid growth stage. So can... Um, can Facebook grow uh, for the next 40 years at the rate it has grown for the last five years? Okay, well, the answer is no. Nothing, the laws of physics would tell us that nothing can grow at an above average rate forever because uh, if it did, it would have to take over everything else. We wouldn't have, you know, different countries, uh, you know, we, Earth and Pluto would all just become Facebook, right? So Facebook, and even though I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg does a great job with it, if you look at the Wonder Boys, uh, Sergey and I forget his partner's name at, at uh, Google, these are high growth companies, but eventually, even those companies have to be average growth. Nothing can grow at an above average rate forever. Uh, so um, we're, we're looking at firms here that are having temporarily high growth. Well, does it make sense to then say, well, the price today is equal to next year's cash flow or dividend divided by K minus G, right? Well, no, because this G is going to be, you know, wildly big now. And if you make it small, then you're missing the growth that they will have over the next few years. So you're going to have to have, the, you're going to have to make this a multi-stage model. So in other words, you're going to have to assume that you're going to have a, a temporarily high growth that is then going to moderate somehow in the future. So what we're going to look at then is see, well, through time, okay, if we're looking at, uh, at growth, then, you know, for Facebook, maybe it's going to have really high growth up here at 23%. Uh, for the next five years, and then after that, it's going to drop down, and it's going to drop to, you know, 4%, which is going to be the average nominal growth rate in the economy or something like that. Now, this isn't a very, real, a very realistic assumption that it drops off all at once. Hey, we're going to do some things that will correct that when we get to level two, uh, but for the most part, let's just go with that. We're going to have high growth for a while. We're going to call that the estimation stage, and then we're going to have a terminal value once growth stabilizes. Do we know how to value something that uh, has a constant growth rate forever? Well, sure, we have the Gordon growth model, right? So we're just going to estimate dividends during the rapid growth stage, uh, and then we're going to use the Gordon growth model to find a terminal value, being very careful to manage our subscripts, and then we're going to discount all that back to today. No big deal. So we're going to calculate the value of a stock. Let's say that last year's dividend was a dollar, so that was D0. For two years, it's going to grow up 15%. After that, it's going to grow up 5%. The required return is 11%. What we want to do is we want to say, okay, well, we're going to stand here at time zero. We want to predict the dividend or forecast the dividend at time one. We want to forecast the dividend at time two. And we could forecast the dividend at time three. We'll talk about some options there. But we're going to forecast cash flows for a while, and then we're going to calculate a terminal value based on a constant growth of 5%. So eventually, we're going to plug into the Gordon growth and say that the, the price or the terminal value at that point in time, uh, and there's a couple of options for where we do that, is going to be a function of the dividend one year later divided by 0.11 minus 0.05, right? So we got to plug in the subscripts and plug in um, the cash flows here. That makes sense? So let's estimate dividends and then find a terminal value and discount it all back, being very careful about the, about the subscripts. 
Well, here's the thing. So if we take $1 as the dividend times zero, we grow up forward at 15%, then D1 is going to be $1.15, not a lot of uncertainty about that. D2 is going to be, we're just moving it forward two years, so we're going to get D2 of 32% of $1.32, excuse me, so um, growth, total growth factor will be 32, uh, so $1.32. So what does that mean for us? Well, we could also calculate the first what I call normal dividend okay, as, as uh, uh, $1.39. That's actually the way I prefer to do it. So I would say, look, we're standing here at time zero. We're going to have a dividend of $1.15, okay, a dividend of $1.32, and then a dividend of $1.39. And this is our super normal period. Okay, and this is going to be our normal period. Right? So uh, I could take this and discount it back to time zero. Just plug it in my calculator. Discount it back at 11%. Okay, we always discount back at the required return. So discount this back at 11% for two years. And this one I'm going to take and I'm going to drop into my Gordon growth model. So I'm going to take 1.39. I'm going to divide it by 0.11 minus 0.05 because that's my constant growth rate. And that's going to give me a value. But where on the timeline does that value fall? Well, this is equal to the dividend at time three. So if I plug into the Gordon growth model, I'm going to get a value at time two, right? So if I plug in a dividend at time three, I'm going to get a value at time two. So whatever this turns out to be, and I don't remember what it is, it's going to show up here, terminal value. So we actually could add $1.32 and the terminal value together and then discount them back. Does that make sense? Okay, that would be one way to do it. Okay, the other way to do it would be to recognize that all this stuff that we see over here on, under dividend three, this is really the first of the dividends. Even though we grew at 15% at to get there, that's the first dividend that's going to be growing at a rate of 5%. So I could take that $1.32, I could drop $1.32 into my Gordon growth model, divide it by 0.11 minus uh, 0.05, and since this is D2, I'm going to get a, va a value at time one, right? So this is going to be a little bigger. $1.39 is bigger than $1.32. The denominator is the same. But the difference is going to be completely uh, offset in the amount of discounting because this one would have to be discounted two years. This one only one year. So what this $1.32 divided by 0.11 minus 0.05, whatever that value comes out to be, and I'm going to show you in just a minute, okay, that terminal value represents the time one value of the dividends uh, starting at $1.32 at time two and then growing at 5% forever. So it would save us one step if we wanted to do it this way. We wouldn't have to do all this over here. And that said, I still prefer to keep my stages separate. Uh, so uh, Doug Van Eaton, who uh, puts all this together, uh, will do anything to save a step. And so uh, that's what we've got here. So we, can, we have to decide how we want to do this. And we'll look at it both ways real quick. So uh, what, what we want to do is be able to plug in and say, what is the value? Well, if we plug in the value at time 2, okay, divide it by 0.11 minus 0.05, k minus g, then we're going to get a value at time 1 of $22. How do I know that's a time 1 value? Because I plugged in time 2. So looking at my timeline, I'm going to have $1.15 here. Okay, I will have counted, calculated $1.32 here, drop that into my Gordon growth model. I'm just going to write GGM for Gordon growth model. And that's going to give me $22, but that $22 belongs here, right? $22 because it's a time one value. What's the big economic intuition? There is none. It's just arithmetic. You plug in a time two value, you get a value at time one. Time two cash flow, you get a value at time one. So I could add $22 and $1.15 to get $23.15 and then discount that back to get the value. All right? That's what we see on the next slide. So I know that if I plug in D2, I get 22. So uh, that's going to give me $1.15 at time one. 22 also at time one tells me the value of the stock today is $20.86. All right? That's if I want to apply the Gordon growth model to the last of the super normal dividends. The other way to do that would be to estimate one more dividend, dividend at time three, and use that in the Gordon growth model. Well, if we do that, we get $1.39 here. That's dividend at time three, just like we wrote on the whiteboard a moment ago. And that would give us $23.17. But since this is D3, this is going to be a value at time two, right? So I'm going to have the cash flow at time one, $1.15. The cash flow at time two, $1.32, plus $23.17. 
that's also a time two value. So I could have added those two numerators together, right? I could have got uh, $24 and what is that, uh, 50 cents almost, 49 cents, uh, and then just done the discounting once. But uh, what I'm going to get is the same value. Now you can see there's a few pennies difference, but that's because uh, this isn't really $1.17. It's $23.1742 something or something like that. Anyway, since I rounded to the penny, I get a little bit of an estimation error here. Not enough to cause any problems on the exam but you're going to get the same answer either way. So here's my, here's my advice. Okay? You decide what you understand. Do you like to keep your, set, your, uh, set your growth stages separate? If so, do it like this. If you want to save an equation and you understand why it works the same either way, do it Doug's way, but do it one way, learn it, and do it that way all the time. So it doesn't matter which one you use. You're going to get the same answer. So uh, I just don't want you to be confused as to why we're doing it uh, two different ways. All right? So this is two-stage dividend discount. And if you look over the curriculum and you asked me, uh, Andy, tell me one thing that you think is going to show up in uh, multiple questions on the CFA exam. Well, my best guess would be that you're going to see two-stage dividend discount type stuff show up multiple times. So I think it's a really important topic. Okay, so dividend discount uh, model use. So um, uh, the Gordon growth model is appropriate when, okay, well, when you're looking at a stable, mature firm. Uh, so this would be something like a utility firm or a real estate investment trust uh, and something that's non-cyclical. Also, you can use it uh, for... Uh, uh, you know, a large equity index like the S&P 500, and you can also use it for terminal values in more complex models. Two-stage, this is going to be appropriate for firms that currently have high growth, but they can't be high growth forever, uh, so eventually that's going to have to come down. We also have three-stage models here, which would be where, you know, if you're looking at time against growth, you have high growth, medium growth, and low growth. This wouldn't be a problem. You just chart the dividends according to the growth rate, and eventually you're going to have to plug in the GGM. All the models have to work to the point where you have a stable, a stable environment. Okay. That said, I don't think this is a particularly high likelihood for the exam, because if you can do this for, one, for two stages, high growth, low growth, then you can do it for three stages, high growth, medium growth, low growth, or 22 stages, right? So uh, this is, uh, gets to be you know, just more complex uh, in terms of the way of thinking about the equation. Uh, if we had a way to get over that big drop all at once, then that would be perhaps a better model. We won't see that, though, until we, got to, until we get to level two. All right? So that's dividend discount stuff. Now let's talk about price multiples or, re or relative valuation. So for price multiples, uh, again, this is going to be where we are taking value and we are going to standardize it by some type of... Uh, of uh, economically rational uh, variable. So price per square foot for homes, uh, price per room if we're going to value hotels, um, you know, price per gallon if we're buying gasoline, and here it's going to be price per dollar in earnings. So what sort of earnings multiple are you paying? Well, if you look at two firms, okay, uh, they both have an earnings of $1. One of them is uh, trading at 15 times earnings, the other is trading at 9 times earnings. Well, why is that different? Well, there's a bunch of reasons that could differ. Okay, probably the biggest single reason would be growth. Okay, but this firm, the market says that firm is worth 15 times earnings. For every $1 in earnings, they're going to pay $15. This one, for every $1 in earnings, the market will pay you $9, right? So a price-to-earnings ratio, uh, we can either get that from fundamentals or we can go out and get comparables. We'll talk about that in a little while. If you don't want to use the price-to-earnings ratio, Okay, then you can, all, you can all, all opt into something else. So the price to cash flow has lots of traction among institutional investors. Price to sales, so price per share divided by sales per share, that's uh, something we see if we're talking about really highly distressed firms. Okay, and then uh, price to book, well, this actually is price, uh, price per share of equity divided by book value per share of equity. And uh, this actually has uh, lots of traction as well in terms of a value indicator. So all four of these metrics, PE, P cash flow, PS, and PB, in the long run, they have uh, solid statistical relationships to uh, the cross-section of returns. Uh, it's all negative. The higher the multiple, the lower the returns. But nonetheless, all these are shown to be related to, return, to stock returns uh, in the long run. Okay, so uh, this is a very common approach. You've seen it a number of times. So the advantages here uh, in terms of uh, price multiples, well, it's widely used, readily available. They're easy to calculate. Uh, you can use them, uh, them cross-sectionally. You can evaluate all the firms in the industry, or you can look at one firm through time. And like I said, they are statistically associated with equity returns. So uh, you can, the, 
the ability to do this and the ability to watch other people do it is very high. Okay, so uh, there's also some limitations associated with these, and we'll see those later. So uh, price to earnings based on fundamentals. Well, if this is just our Gordon growth model, right? The price today is equal to the dividend time 1 divided by K minus G. Well, if we take this and we divide it by earnings, and we take this and divide it by earnings, okay, and we're actually going to do this with uh, leading earnings, so forecast earnings over the next year, we could either use we could do forward-looking earnings or backward-looking earnings. We're going to use forward-looking earnings here. Well, okay, so did we change anything if we divided both sides by E? We didn't, but then we can gather terms, all right? So just do a little algebra, and what we get is this, okay? And this is certainly something you would want to put on your formula sheet. And this is the P-E ratio. It's a formula for the P-E ratio via what's called forecasted fundamentals. So two ways to go about this. Hey, one would be to say, well, if I want to understand uh, the value of some company, right? So I want to understand the value of my subject company. I'm going to call it X. Okay. Well, uh, I know its earnings are equal to 2, okay? but what is its price? Okay. What is it worth? Okay. Well, if I have three comparables, you know, C1, C2, and C3, and I think that uh, you know, the drivers of value for my company X are the same as these comparables, and I you know, find that uh, you know, the P-E ratios for these uh, comparable companies. And of course, I would have to standardize accounting stuff and it'd be a very involved process. But if it's uh, 9, 10, and 11, okay, well, I could find the average of these if I just wanted to take the average. Of course, if you're my investment banker and you're just taking averages, I'm going to be upset. But the average is going to be 10. So the P-E ratio, the mean average for the P-E ratios here, uh, is going to be equal to 10. Well, what I could do is remember that P-E okay, times E is going to just, you know, E's are going to cancel, and that's going to leave me with price, right? So if I wanted, I have E here of 2, so I have a mean P-E ratio for my comparables. I take P-E, uh, well, let's see, I think I take the P-E of 10, and I multiply it by the earnings of 2, and that would give me $20 as the price per share of X, all right? So this is called the method of comparables, right? You go out and find some similar firms, find their PEs, then you uh, calculate the, the PE for, you know, the average PE for the comparables, apply it to your subject firm. You got to do a lot of thinking. It takes a lot more time than what I did here. Uh, but in the, in the end, that gives us an estimate of value. So this is method of comparables. This is forecasted fundamentals. So I would say, okay, the PE ratio is going to be equal to this thing, which is the leading dividend yield, di dividends next year divided by earnings next year, over K minus G. Uh, and it's just a formula. And this is going to come out to be something like, you know, five or something like that. So so that's going to be a P-E ratio that I can calculate with a formula based in the fundamentals. What's my payout, uh, what, what is my uh, payout ratio, what is my cost of capital, what is my growth rate? So the higher the growth rate, okay, that means big growth rate, we're subtracting it, small denominator, high growth rate, high ratio. If I have a really risky firm, I get a big K, right, so the higher required return. Big K, big denominator, that's going to give me a low P-E ratio. And then, all else equal anyway, if the, if the payout ratio is higher and doesn't impact anything else, then that's going to give me a higher P-E ratio as well. All right? So that's what we said down here. So other things equal, and this is a really important caveat, okay, higher dividend payout ratio is going to lead to a higher P-E. Higher growth rate is going to lead to higher P-E. And lower risk slash lower required return is going to lead to higher P-E. The problem with that analysis, this is called comparative statics, only vary one thing. What if we increase the payout ratio? Well, if you increase the payout ratio, so I'm going to put PO for payout, then you're going to decrease the retention ratio, right? If you decrease the retention ratio, remember our formula for growth, it's going to be ROE times uh, the retention ratio. Well, if you increase the payout ratio, you're driving down the retention ratio. Does that impact growth? Okay, well, so uh, note that increases in the payout ratio will decrease the growth rate, and that may mean that increasing this may decrease this, and that makes the impact uh, uh, indeterminate. So I would make sure I knew the comparative statics, but I'd also be aware of the, of the potential relationship between payout and growth. All right? So anyway, so this is payout based on uh, fundamentals, uh, and uh, excuse me, this is PE. Uh, based on fundamentals, I'd certainly make sure I had that on my formula sheet. So uh, as a real quick example, you have a firm that's going to pay out 30% of its earnings. Uh, its dividends are going to grow at a constant rate of 6%. The required return is 13. All I got to do is plug and chug, and that tells me that the P-E ratio is 4.3. That looks really low to you, I'm sure. 
But remember, we started out, this formula comes from the Gordon growth model. That assumes that the firm is growing at a really slow, constant pace. Okay, so you would expect to have a low P.E. ratio. We could do this for, you know, a three-stage model with, you know, all sorts of growth uh, assumptions embedded in it. Divide both sides by E and solve for the, you know, make it uh, look pretty. The problem is there's no way to make it look pretty. It's going to take up an entire slide, so we don't do that uh, in, the, uh, in the curriculum here. If you want to see it, uh, DeModeran's got a textbook out that has a lot of that sort of stuff. So anyway, uh, good second week in June topic, um, or second week in December, depending on when you're taking the level one exam. So anyway, so this is uh, PE based on forecasted fundamentals. Okay, the price multiples, PE, okay, so PS, price divided by a share, the, Price per share divided by sales per share, PB, price per share divided by the book value per share, or price to cash flow, price divided by cash flow per share. Cash flow can either be the operating cash flow or free cash flow, or it can be something else. Uh, and you know, just make sure that if you're using compar if you're using method of comparables, whatever you're doing for your comparables, you're also doing for your subject firm. Okay, so use of pr uh, pr price multiple comparables like we've been talking about. This is based on the law of one price. So that says, look, if these two firms are the same, they have the same growth prospects, the same capital requirements, the same risk associated with them. If you have uh, one firm, okay, we'll call it uh, PE sub C for our comp. If you, people are willing to pay 12 times earnings for that, and our firm is identical, okay, well then we should have a PE rate of 12 as well, right? Because if they're the same thing, we're paying per dollar of earnings, okay, well then uh, the law of one price tells us that uh, those ought to be constant across the two firms. The problem is everything else is never constant, right? So if you want to know what the value of Walmart is, well you can go find the value, uh, you know, the PE for, uh, you know, Target and Home Depot and whoever else you think are big discount retailers, but uh, they're not going to be exactly the same as Walmart in terms of growth prospects, risk, all those types of things. So if you're using the method of comparables, you've got to make the calculations and then you ask yourself, well, okay, Walmart has a higher PE than its comparison group, but maybe it should have a higher PE than its comparison group given its superior growth opportunities or something like that, all right? Okay, one more of these relative valuation. This is going to be EV EBITDA we talked a little bit about earlier. Okay, remember, there's, there's not too much that's going to be hard here, but there's a couple of twists that you have to get down. So first of all, remember that EV is the enterprise value. That's going to be the market value of the common stock and the market value of the debt. And then we're going to subtract out cash and marketable securities. All right? So we're looking at just the, the, market, the, the capital here that is... Uh, I guess you could call it risk capital, right? So those things, these assets that we have in here, we're going to get rid of those, and uh, the enterprise value is going to be based just on these other two things. Okay, so the EV represents the market value of the firm, so that's the value of the debt and the equity, so that's the firm value. EBITDA, again, is a crude measure of uh, free cash flow to the firm. That is the cash flow that is available to both debt and equity holders. So the first caveat here is this idea that we've got to subtract out cash and marketable securities. Market value of common stock, number of shares times price per share. Market value of debt, they're going to give us some information on that. And then subtract out cash and marketable securities. That's going to be the numerator, EV. And EBITDA, well, that's just going to be EBITDA. Okay, so, um, uh, and it's useful if we want to get a firm value or if we're looking at firms that have very different capital structures. So one has 40% debt, the other has 70% debt. Well, that tends to have weird effects on equity type things. So maybe we're going to value the entire firm come up with a value for the entire firm, and then subtract out the, the, value, the market value of the debt in order to get back to the equity, right? Uh, so if earnings are negative, uh, you can't use a PE ratio, so maybe this is a better alternative. So there's times when it makes sense to do this. Actually, I think this is uh, something that's very commonly used on the street, all right? Okay, so here, let's try a quick example. So the stock price is 40, the shares outstanding are 200. So if we multiply those two things together, that's gonna be the market value of equity. The market value of long-term debt is 600. The book value of um, long-term debt is 900. Okay, so this is a common uh, sort of, I said there's two caveats. One was to remember to subtract out cash and marketable securities. Okay, the other is to see what's going on here. So uh, when we look at the book value of total debt, it's 2.1 million. Well, if the book value of total debt is 2.1 million, what's the, what is the book value of short-term debt? Well, total debt is 2.1, that's long and short. So we take 2.1 million, okay, and we subtract off 900,000. Uh, then that tells me that uh, the, uh, the book value of short-term debt is going to be equal to uh, 1.2, 1,200. Uh, so 1,200, uh, 1.2 million, right? 
Okay, well, here's the deal. When you look at short-term debt, the value on the balance sheet and market value don't generally diverge very much. It diverges quite a bit for uh, long-term debt, but not for short-term debt. So what they're doing here is really a, this is beyond just understanding the concept, okay, but they're saying, look, if you want, if you want to take the value of short-term debt from the books, use that, and then just get the market value of long-term debt, add those two things together, that's a good estimate of the market value of total debt. So book value and market value for short-term stuff is pretty close, in other words. So there's this one little caveat here that you've got to keep in mind. They tell us that cash and marketable securities are 250000 so we're going to have to subtract that as we calculate EV. And then EBITDA down here is equal to a million. Let's calculate the EV-EBITDA ratio. So first of all, we've got to determine the market value of short-term debt and liabilities. So we assume the market value, um, uh, the, assume that market value equals book value for short-term debt. Well, the book value of short-term debt is total debt minus 900 minus the book value of long-term debt. We already did this, 2.1 minus 900. So here is both the market and the book value of short-term debt. What we need for EV is we need the market value of equity plus the market value of debt. This is the market value of short-term debt. So we need to add in the market value of long-term debt, which they give us here. That'll be the market value of the total debt, right? So uh, we come over here and we say, okay, we got 1.2 in short term, we got 600,000 in long term. Okay, so our market value of our debt position is 1.8 million. What about the market value of equity? That's just going to be price per share times the number of shares outstanding. So that's 8 million. So if we take 1.8 million and we add it to and we add 8 million to it, so we get 9.8 million. Well, is that going to be EV? Well, it's the market value of debt plus the market value of equity, so it's close. But we got to remember to subtract out the value of the uh, uh, cash and marketable securities. So we have 1.8 million in debt, 8 million in equity. We're going to subtract out this $250,000 in uh, cash and marketable securities. So the enterprise value here is going to be 9.55 million. So let's calculate our EV ratio. We're going to take 9.55 million, divide it by um, uh, 1 million, and that's going to give us 9.6 as we've rounded it here. So this company is trading at 9.6 times EBITDA, right? So uh, if we look at this and we say 9.6, hmm, then we go out and we say, all right, so our company X has an EV EBITDA ratio of 9.6. Then we go out and we find comparable companies, same growth opportunities, all that sort of stuff. So C1, comparable company two, comparable company three, just like we've done before. We find their uh, EV to EBITDA ratio, and it's five and six and seven. I can average those. So that gives us an average of six. Well, now how does this look? Well, this company may be overvalued, right? Because uh, companies that look a lot like it are trading at an EV, EV EBITDA ratio of six. So maybe this company is overvalued, right? Uh, so that's the way we would use the EV to EBITDA ratio. Uh, and being able to compute it, again, two caveats. One, don't forget to subtract the 250,000 cash and marketable securities. And don't forget this little trick where they say short-term debt, book and market are the same. So you got to work backwards into the book value of debt and then add in the market value of long-term debt. Okay, so EV to EBITDA. Hey, what about the asset-based models? So the asset-based models, well, here the equity is equal to the market value or fair value of the assets less the liabilities. Uh, so, of course, uh, adjusting the book value to, to market value for the assets is going to be a big deal, but it's got to be done. Uh, and that's going to say, okay, we have the market value, the fair market value of the assets, and we're going to subtract off the uh, fair market value of the liabilities, and that's going to give us the equity position in the firm. Uh, but remember, asset valuation typically is giving us a floor value. So uh, asset uh, valuation says, well, this is for a non-going concern. If we're just going to break it up and sell off the pieces, okay, well, that would be the value of the equity stake. So uh, thinking of present value models, this is back to our dividend discount stuff. What's good about it? It's theoretically sound, widely accepted, disadvantages. Inputs have to be estimated, and valuation can be very sensitive to inputs. In particular, it can be sensitive to the estimate of G, growth rates. So uh, I do some training for one of the big banks in my little company, and I always tell the new analysts there, look, it's all about G. So we spend a lot of time estimating, you know, what's the cash flow in the numerator? Uh, you know, what's the cost of capital? We spend a lot of time thinking about that. Okay, if we get G right, we're much more likely to be close on our valuation than anything else. Okay, so uh, the multiplier models, of course, they're widely used, very easy to calculate. Uh, if we're just comparing one company to another within an industry, that's a, a great scenario in which to use those. Uh, it's useful for either time series or cross-sectional. 
The problem is that you're using accounting data, and accounting data can be manipulated and is different based on the assumptions that the management teams are making, so comparability is limited. Also, multiples for cyclical companies are going to change a lot over the business cycle. Asset-based models, well, this if you want a floor value for the company, then uh, use an asset-based model. Uh, it works best for firms with lots of tangible assets, in particular short-term assets. If you have a firm that you can use the going firm assumption, this is going to be too low. Right? So the fair value of the assets can be difficult to estimate depending on what the assets look like. Uh, and then finally, which of these models should you use? Well, it depends on what you're doing. So the model you should choose is going to be based on, one, what sort of, where do we have confidence in our inputs? Okay, so it should be based on the intended use of the model. So are we just doing a head-to-head -head comparison between two firms? Or are we trying to actually come up with a value for a merger bid? Those types of things. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that more complexity is better. Okay? Uh, it's like, uh, you know, songs, simple melodies are good melodies, right? So uh, you use additional complexity when the situation warrants additional complexity, but you don't use it just because it's complexity. Uh, consider you, we, ought to, we ought to use more than one method so we can compare them, right? Uh, and uh, when you get two methods that give you a, a value that's really close, well, that's good confirmation. Of course, that rarely happens in the world. What you're going to get is uh, you know, one that's higher and one that's lower, and you're going to have to think about why those are different. Uh, you want to think about the uncertainty with respect to the input values for the, method, for the different methods. And then, uh, what about model appropriateness? So have you used the appropriate model and, uh, for what you're doing and uh, for the industry you're working in, those types of things? Well, that's going to be important as well. Okay, so this was a fairly long reading, but uh, it's one that um, there's uh, you know, a number of readings in the equity material here. So if you took uh, the number of uh, questions, equity questions that are going to be on the exam and divided it by the number of readings, well, I think that this is, that wouldn't be a good representation of the number of questions you'll see on this reading. In other words, this is going to be tested more than one whatever this is of the number of readings in uh, the equity material. So um, uh, this is something that even though it's a little longer, I'd pay attention to. Also, I don't want you to look past the level one exam, but this is going to be the starting point for level two, where the models are going to get more complex. So uh, if you learn it here, then uh, you're going to get paid for it again when you start level one or start level two. So really important material and certainly something that you can practice, uh, hang your hat on, and when exam day gets here, uh, knowing this reading is going to get you some points. Hey, good luck with this equity stuff. It was a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I hope to see you in a, in a level two uh, video or level two seminar someday.